this is the, the session for uh, using Drupal in nonprofits. Uh, it sounded like most folks in the room have uh, a background more on the support side than the nonprofit side. Uh, so I'm going to tailor a little bit to make those assu that assumption. Um, but I, I won't leave you behind. I'll go here. Are we okay? Yes. Okay. My name is Aaron Crosman. I am one of the senior developers at Message Agency. Uh, before that, I spent 10 years working for a nonprofit organization. So I've been doing online communications work uh, in the nonprofit space for since uh, 2002, uh, when I was first assigned to take over the, the web server for an international uh, nonprofit organization. Uh, and this is uh, Chris Piper. Uh, Chris used to work with me at uh, American Friends Service Committee, and then uh, left us to work at Friends General Conference, uh, who, which was a partner organization the place I used to work. Uh, and is now a client of ours at Message Agency. Uh, and Chris will talk a little bit about some of the ways that uh, they've been using uh, Drupal uh, at FGC and also just some, talk through some of the considerations uh, that you go through when, when doing a nonprofit project. Just a quick note so I'm, my title is Director of Communications. Um, I'm responsible for everything that runs on our web server and our database. Um, we're a small nonprofit, about 25 staff. We serve Quaker congregations in the United States and Canada. So in general, Drupal has been used heavily in the nonprofit technology community really since uh, Drupal 4.5, 4.6, uh, when the larger nonprofits started to recognize that they needed to get off of their static websites that were supported by Dreamweaver and other similar tools and onto proper CMS platforms. Uh, at this point, it is very widely used by a variety of different size and type organizations. Um, this is just a collection of folks that I have relationships with, whether it's American Friends Service Committee, uh, where I brought Drupal in, Friends General Conference, where Chris is, uh, the Beinecke Library at Yale University, Historical Society of Pennsylvania, all have very different uses of Drupal, very different size uh, in organizations, uh, different sized websites, different web strategies. Uh, but all have successfully used Drupal uh, for a number of years now. Do well, I guess Planet is brand new, but other than that, it's... Do you have any experience with membership driven nonprofits? Uh, so, uh, AFSC had some membership stuff. Uh, Historical Society of Pennsylvania uses it, uh, has a great deal of membership uh, driven uh, content on their website. Uh, you know, everybody treats their constituents and supporters slightly differently, uh, but it is very widely used. There are a number of tools that uh, can support the needs of members. It depends on how you want to engage with your members. You know, some have it's just about renewing your membership, uh, you know, and just tracking it that way. Others have more encompassing engagements that they try to maintain. Uh, and yes, Google has can do all of those things or be part of the solution to all of those things. Um, I'll actually get to some of that further in in terms of how you think about integrating things in. In general, people have picked Drupal because it's so flexible. Um, it's powerful, and uh, you can handle almost any content strategy. So I mentioned that the four organizations that are up there range from uh, one stand basically independent site that mostly drives all of the content to uh, organizations that have a half a dozen sites uh, that are intentionally uh, using different pro online properties to support their organizations in different ways. That flexibility then comes, of course, with the caveat of you have to deal with it. Um, you can set up Drupal really, really badly, uh, particularly in nonprofits, and then nonprofits get stuck really fast because they don't have the budgets to bail themselves back out. Uh, and so you have to be very careful to make sure it's done well the first time so it will grow with them. Um, one of the biggest concerns in nonprofit space is doing really good online fundraising tools. Having a fully integrated pure Drupal, uh, best practices, PCI compliant, effective, safe fundraising solution is really, really hard. Nothing is technically impossible, um, but I haven't seen that done yet for a you know, pure Drupal instance, uh, that they got all the way through following good best practices and managed PCI compliance. Uh, the only organization that I know that comes close spent a huge amount of money and spends a lot of time trying to maintain their PCI compliance. It's 
very hard to keep credit cards all the way up to date. The time huge. Uh, that was a uh, initial project budget of upwards of six digits. I mean, it was a, a, a medium sized six digit number. Uh, man, we did a whole lot more than just fundraising, but it, you know, to get up to a project where it was worth putting the effort in. It's why you see a lot of folks at uh, Blackboard related products or salsa labs as third party vendors for the fundraising because they provide that really well, um, even though there's some reasons people hate the rest of their tool sets. <laughs> I'm, I'm very interested in the uh, uh, flexibility of uh, the fact that e-commerce and donation-driven pages for nonprofits coming on mm -hmm. your website. So I attended earlier the Drupal Commerce session. So wouldn't that be a solution? So Drupal Commerce works really well when you're running a store. Um, the they problem is when you're running a donation pages. Too. It, when you're trying to run the store and the donation pages at the same time, it's not that it's impossible. Um, it's and you can get commerce, you know, working with their vendors to be compliant. It, it is possible. Um, and there's no doubt about it. But it's not easy. Um, and typically, usually, folks who have done it, when I've seen it done in commerce, um, somebody either gave up on the best practices of single page donation forms with the ability to reorganize them flexibly. Uh, they either gave that up or they gave up PCI compliance. Um, usually they give up the flexibility because PCI compliance will bite you if you give it up. They address, PCI, yeah. they address PCI compliance using credit card tokens. But, mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah. but I think I, I understand what you're saying. saying that, yeah, it's when you, yeah. when you need to be, have the flexibility of some of the form stuff that gets... It's hard to do that with tokenization. Uh, again, it's not impossible. I, I would never say it's impossible. I, it, it can be done. Uh, so to harp a little on that, I want to move on to some of the, just focus quickly here on some of the strengths where Drupal has done well in the nonprofit space. Uh, because there is the, the non-licensing, it allows folks to be flexible about how they organize their web properties. You don't end up having to have one website with five editors and be stuck because otherwise you have to pay a licensing fee for too many additional folks or one for each seat of your, you know, web property, that it allows you to have a product, uh, you know, a strategy that goes anywhere you want. Um, there are a plethora of great hosting options. Um, that often gets underplayed for nonprofits. People kind of ignore the importance of hosting. It's, in my experience, at least as critical, if not more critical than in other places, because they don't often have the overhead staff uh, or the overhead budgets to really provide, to bail themselves out, they have to be on a good hosting environment that can take care of them in a crisis. Um, as folks here will know, there's also the, the contrib modules, the ability to integrate with the social media platforms, be able to expand into new places as they emerge that you can continue to adapt. Uh, and that's one of the, the real benefits. And again, nonprofits get often beaten up a bit for not being innovators uh, in technology spaces, and that's really not actually true on the web. They're usually running risks and taking and experimenting with new social media tools in particular ahead of most anybody else. Um, they're often using those tool sets first. Uh, and so being in a platform like Drupal where those tools are emerging very rapidly out of the community can be really uh, helpful and advantageous. Um, that said, nothing's perfect. Uh, the Nonprofits almost universally need outside help to set them up. They're, they usually do not have the staff to do it internally. Um, their budgets are rarely in line with their wish lists. Um, <laughs> they, you know, Drupal can scale to your budget, whatever your budget is. But if your budget, you know, if your vision outstretches your budget, that's still not going to magically make it happen. Um, it requires somebody who's paying attention both to what's going on now, but being able to handle the updates that come out, the changes in the strategies that make sense, the new tools that need to be done, security patching. Uh, and again, that's often something that uh, nonprofits don't have the internal resources to do, or those internal resources are often very much stretched. Uh, one of the things that I've run into a number of folks, uh, and again, you see it outside of nonprofits, but I see it a lot within them, is that issue of the, the tailoring of the back end uh, experience, particularly for the content editors. 
where you've got somebody who you know, is really passionate about the mission of the organization and really does not want to have to care at all about setting up uh, you know, how they go about editing content. They want it to just magically work. Uh, and because Drupal has such the generalized interface, it works decently as a generalized interface, but they're not working in a generalized world. They're working on their website every day, and they would like it to work for their website. Um, but it's also the first piece that gets thrown to the floor when the budget doesn't meet the wish list. That perfect thing editing interface is often the first thing people are willing to give up. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, the, doing online donations effectively um, is really hard. Again, I wouldn't ever go so far as to say it's impossible, but it is not something that's uh, cooked in and easy to just snap into place. It requires a lot of a lot of consideration and effort. Um, so, with those risks, particularly with the donation issue, why is it so popular? Um, it's because there's benefits out outweigh the risks. Uh, that there are good solutions, particularly for the online donation, for online advocacy outside of Drupal that you can either integrate or link to effectively and uh, it gives you that flexibility to drive almost any content strategy that the organization can think of uh, and that it will, you can make Drupal adapt to any content strategy you need to have for your organization. Um, so we're going to switch gears a little bit and start talking about considerations. Uh, a lot of these considerations are not actually Drupal specific, um, but are how to think through the project with a nonprofit or as a nonprofit. Um, but we're going to put a Drupal lens on them so that they make sense in that context. <laughs> so that's actually my dog. Um, <laughs> Drupal is not a communication strategy. No website is ever a communication strategy in and of itself. So. At French General Conference, we ended up spending almost three years really refining and building a communication strategy around um, constituent orientation, um, building and structuring uh, our messages, and ultimately maybe restructuring our programs around the needs and interests of the people that we serve. Um, so communication strategies often lead to organizational change if they're done well. And one of the things that's, that you know, Drupal is really amazing about is because it's so flexible, um, we were able to, um, to tailor, we, we did spend some time tailoring the, the content creation experience for our program coordinators that, that are the authors of most of the content on our website. Um, but I, I mean, a, a great example of the um, the power that Drupal provides, um, you know, we we provide services to Quaker congregations throughout the United States and Canada. Um, I did a quick survey and found that fifty percent of them did not have websites. So, as part of our understanding of what is our communication strategy in that three-year assessment period, we figured out that we really wanted to offer a suite of services to Quaker congregations that provided them a website and some tools to manage the life of their congregation. And Drupal was powerful enough to provide that. Um, when, you, when you think about the audience that you're hoping to serve, um, one of the things that we found in that, as we spent time in that communication strategy process, is often the most important audience um, is not the audience with the biggest microphone. So I'm actually next weekend going to our board meeting, and I guarantee you I will hear from our board about, well, you know, I used to be able to go to my part of the organization on the homepage of the website, and I got to get to exactly where, you know, and our old website required you to know and understand our governance and committee structure in order for you to navigate it. The new web experience is not built around our board, and they're cranky about that, and I'm happy to deal with that. Um, so, so that's one of the things that benefits from really taking the time and energy to um, look at what is, the, what is the strategy that you're hoping to achieve 
um, who are the constituents associated with that strategy. And, and you know, the people that matter on the board understand that strategy and, and have my back, which is what's important. And one final piece, hiring a good consultant really helps. Um, we ended up um, going through two and um, ended up with message agency. And Drupal is, had, because it's so flexible and so powerful, you have to be really careful about how you make decisions and how you approach things. Our previous site was impossible to manage and impossible to maintain because there were hundreds of settings where a staff member came to me and said, hey, can we just add this little thing? And it took five seconds to do. And there were 40 content types. And there was workshop 2012 use this one because it was easy to do. One of the things that I've seen both uh, at a nonprofit and consulting with them at, is oops, that's uh, that you can't build and forget that people have this tendency to put a lot of effort and time into building their website and then they walk away mm -hmm. and, and they would like it to just keep working uh, and making sure as part of that content strategy conversation being very clear that your site, your supporters will expect your site to be up to date at three in the morning of whatever day they chose to look at it. Um, now, obviously, you're not updating it necessarily at three in the morning unless you have a lot of staff time to dedicate, but making sure it's clear as part of your strategy who is doing the writing uh, and that the maintenance of the content and the, you know, the presentation of the organization is actually in people's job descriptions, that there's somebody responsible for doing it. Um, one of my wife's uh, kind of favorite habits is to look at the uh, media, uh, the organizations that are politically, you know, are her political opposition, that are, you know, have the opposite viewpoints. Uh, and looking at when Supreme Court cases come out or other major news breaks, that particularly the, the predictable kind, like Supreme Court rulings, that you know the smart organizations are there that day, twenty minutes, an hour later they have a response. The organizations that she doesn't tend to worry much about and usually just finds cute are the ones that it takes a week or two weeks or three weeks because they're not dedicating the time to be really effective in their advocacy, um, and that the folks who are ready have somebody who sat down and wrote the three possible outcomes from any Supreme Court case. Decide where you won, the version where you lost, and the version where it's really complicated and you don't really know <coughs> the first couple of days, and you have to read it three times to figure it out. But you can, the first two of those statements are really easy to write. <laughs> and you can write them before you know. Uh, and making sure, again, that that's part of somebody's job and part of somebody's plan, so that you're ready to go and you're responsive. Because your constituents are watching. Uh, and they will care, and it will matter for the long term. So, one of the great things about any open source system that is also a challenge is custom code. Um, and in case you haven't heard it yet, don't hack core, ever. <laughs> don't make changes to the core Drupal install, um, or Yes, and if you have a consultant that says, oh yeah, we can do that just by hacking core, walk away. Um, and the same is really true with many of the core modules that a lot of people use, views, um, you know, uh, organic groups. There, there, there are, um, you know, you're spelling disaster or probably spelling your site getting hacked at some point in the future because you can't install security updates. Um, so custom modules can really empower amazing things with Drupal and and you have to also be really careful. So so when we looked at our project budget, um, we knew that, you know we wanted a site that did everything. We wanted a site that um, that really empowered our our programs to do better outreach. We wanted a site that connected to our backend Salesforce database. We wanted and and you know so we were able to go through and look at what percentage of these things can we do with stock modules. And we're really excited to find out that actually 95% of the, the list of functionality that we wanted could be done with stock modules. So we were able to then say, well, looking at our overall project budget, we know that we have a concern about outreach for Quakers and um, supporting Quaker 
congregations having better presence on the web. And with that in mind, um, let's put the money into building a custom add-on to organic groups so that they have this suite of tools to, um, to manage their congregations. And we've just signed up our 60th congregation. So it's, it's been exciting and, and also um, really proven to pay off in terms of the investment. Do you have a list of that 95% of the <laughs> I'd be really interested in I, seeing I, that. I, 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 we can talk afterwards. I can okay. show you the list if you want. Uh, so one of the things that often comes up uh, both, again, from both sides of the conversation is how do you handle updates? Um, right, Drupal provides a huge number of small updates. And uh, you know, the security patches, bug fixes, you know, all those little things. And then there's those occasional major updates. Drupal goes from six to seven to eight, one day to nine. Uh, and making sure it's very clear from the very beginning of the project that those are coming. Um, that the nonprofit needs to understand that again, this isn't kind of fire and forget, you don't just build it and you know hope this works forever, that you're going to need to move forward one day. One of the things that I have found helps with that conversation is the reminder that your communication strategy probably needs to change too. That the web is dynamic, it changes. There are tools there now that weren't there before. There will be new tools six months from there that aren't there now. And if you aren't updating your communication strategy to take advantage of that, you're missing opportunities anyway. But you don't think about your communication strategy all the time because then you're constantly in a state of change and you never actually get anything done. I have found it's really useful to get folks to combine the major updates to Drupal when they come along, that they need to happen, when, you know, when, set, when eight comes out and six needs to be ended on folks, <laughs> to say, you have, if you're still running a Drupal 6 website, probably it's built from a communication strategy that's five or six years old. You need to check to make sure that it's still the way you need to be interacting with your constituents. Is this really how you need to engage with them anyway? And usually the answer is, well, no, not really. Well, usually the answer is, yes, I really think it is, and then you get them to talk about it, and they say, well, actually, we haven't read our communication strategy since we finished writing it, and we haven't done any of those things because they were all really bad ideas. Um, that would make, made a lot of sense in theory, but we aren't actually doing them anymore because we've evolved over the course of time. And then you start talking to them about the rough edges of their website, and there's something that's driving them nuts because it made a lot of sense for the web strategy that they wrote five years ago, but not for what they're actually doing in the real world today. Uh, and getting them to combine those conversations and make it into a project that allows you to move forward uh, into the new versions in a relatively timely manner and be happy with the outcome as opposed to being constantly frustrated by those 16 rough edges that have emerged over the last <laughs> five or six years. <laughs> he has such a nice bed and he's always sulking. <laughs> So, Drupal's free. You know, wh what project budget do you need other than just your staff time, right? <laughs> so I, I'm somebody who loves to tinker and I'm totally self-taught with Drupal. And so, so as we were looking at this communication strategy, this three-year process, uh, I started with the assumption that I was building it myself. You know, I've got my staff time, it should be great. And as the more that we sat and the more that we looked at um, what we were trying to do, the amount of custom code we were looking at, um, and, and the fact that I had to continue doing all of my other responsibilities while also um, launching a new website, it became really clear that we needed to reach out and we needed to bring in a partner. Um, and one of the things that we found was, um, you know, there's only, your view on the Drupal universe is only so big and can only ever be so big. And it's it's a huge world. And so bringing in a, an outside firm that has specific experience with nonprofits, um, you know, we 
I've had, had firms talk about, you know, please outline your business processes and, um, you know, there's, these things just aren't, the, the way in which nonprofits function and the politics and um, the goals and what is a success is just, is just different than, than most of the for-profit world. Um, so, so unless it's a really small project, I, um, certainly from our experience, bringing in an outside shop um, was absolutely critical um, to, to being successful and to actually achieving your goals close to the timeline that you're hoping for. And I think the one final thing, you know, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to install security patches and updates to Drupal modules, and it's really nice to have a support contract where somebody else can just take care of it. So, the, you know, having that ongoing relationship, that also means, you know, there's a lot, I have holes in my knowledge from, from things that I haven't gotten around teaching myself around running a server or around running a site, and, and having a backdrop the backstop for me to, you know, bounce ideas off of or just run to when I'm, you know, have really badly broken something is, is really very helpful. <laughs> so then the counterpart is what, you know, what can nonprofits avoid pay? Uh, where is it that you can look for savings in the time uh, and the budget? One of the things that always comes up in every conversation I've ever had with a nonprofit with an existing website is you've got to save our content. How are we going to migrate our content forward? <laughs> it's really, really important we've been writing it for seven, eight years. There's thousands of pages we've got to migrate it. Um, and my first question is, have you read it? When was the last time you actually read all of your content? Because if it was so good, of course you read it all the time because it's brilliant. Um, <laughs> and as it turns out, usually what it is, is it's a collection of stories that were really good when they were written. Fact sheets that were really important, but time passed and the facts changed. And the story got old, but it still says this week. <laughs> um, and the child that you saved from some crisis is now going to college. And maybe you should update about why that's even more exciting than the first thing you did, because they wouldn't be in college if you hadn't done whatever you had done early on. Uh, and so being really sure. Migration is also really, really expensive. Um, and when, when I was at the American Friends Service Committee, we, had, we did a major migration into Drupal off of a proprietary system. It was, we had about 25,000 pieces of content in that system. And when we got the bids back, there was no way on earth I could afford uh, to be able to do that migration. And so we talked to the internally and said, we have the staff resources and volunteer resources to migrate 10 pages per office in the organization. Any 10 pages they want. And so that became the plan because we had no choice. And the staff were living. Uh, understandably, they, this was material they worked hard on. Uh, but the office actually was the office here in Atlanta was the first that called me and said, you got to be kidding. We, we have to have this material. I said, well, well, we'll show you how to move your own content. We're guaranteeing you the 10 per office that we can do, and then you're going to have to do the rest. And you can use as much staff time as you want moving it. You can find other grants. If you can find more money, I'll even help you. Um, and they called me back three days later and said, never mind. Throw it all away. Because as they started trying to read through it and prioritizing it, they realized it was all out of date. <laughs> And it was easier to write all fresh content than it was to fix what they had. When we launched that site, they were actually the only section of the organization that did that just flat out kill it all and start from fresh. Um, they had the strongest section of our site outside of the stuff that the, the central office generated. They were the best described local programs, they had the best stories, the best resources, because they had taken the time to go and build it fresh. Uh, and were able to separate themselves from their legacy content. Everybody else, there was this mishmash that we were trying to shoehorn in of old stories and old resources, and they were scrambling to get them updated and make it all fit. Uh, but the folks in the Southeast region really did a nice job of, of having sharp new content. Uh, so we saved money and they were happier. Uh, it was a good deal. The other places that often come up are usually along the way you encounter something that there isn't a module that doesn't already. 
And so you get into the concept of custom module conversation and writing custom code. Uh, often, that feature is not as important as it feels like it is. Uh, it feels really critical, but when you start putting the financial screws to it, is it really uh, the, the most critical thing? In the case with FGC, it was the most critical thing. Most of the budget is also going into that part of the project at this point. You can save a tremendous amount of money if it turns out that's not the most critical function, uh, and you can drive out that, that custom code. Uh, it also makes your site cheaper over time, since you don't have to maintain it. Um, and, and I was mentioning earlier the, the conversation about integrating everything in. Um, how much It is always worth questioning, do you try to get your donor system, your uh, all of your constituent relations, you know, your advocacy, everything integrated into one site. That can be a very effective strategy. It can give a very consistent experience all the way through for your constituents. It's also a tremendously expensive strategy because you have to be able, you know, it's going to require customization because your instance of Salesforce nonprofit starter pack or Salsa Labs or you know, Blackboard and VO, or whichever of the other third parties you use for your higher powered back end, or even City CRM, is not the same as everybody else's. And so there will be customization required to make that work. You can do it. And again, it can be a great experience for your constituents, but it's tremendously expensive and it requires ongoing maintenance. Uh, and so the question is, are, is your organization stronger because of that better experience for your constituents? If it is, it might be worth it, but it's a place, again, to look for, can you reduce your costs there and uh, provide almost as good an experience and keep your constituents just as happy uh, at a much lower price point? This was uh, the, the constant conversation, most nonprofit budgets are fixed, right? Usually the nonprofit working on a web rebuild is doing it off a grant or a gift from a major donor, or some kind of one-time big influx of cash uh, that they don't get again, and they gotta get it used by a certain date, uh, and, and it's gotta, you know, you're, you're stuck within certain prime bounds. Um, and usually, in, in project management, with most consultant work, but particularly with nonprofits, it, you don't end up with pure waterfall strategy of projects where people have actually planned out every move all the way through. Nor do you have true agile where people are being are really being flexible about every sprint in the scrum. Um, nonprofits aren't usually able to make, to play their role in that effectively, and so I, I refer to them as waterfall like or agile like because um, they're usually hybrids uh, in either kind of project. Uh, but either you have a well planned project where you have fixed features that are guaranteed in the contract, and you lose the flex, you give up to get that, the flexibility to change your mind partway through. Because it's going to be out of scope. The change to the plan requires rescoping, uh, which will increase your budget. Um, or you have an agile like process, and that opportunity comes along, and you say, Great, we figured out this idea that we didn't realize was going to be there at the beginning, and we make the change, and now something else just fell off the end of the project list. And some feature is not going to be delivered because you took advantage of an opportunity early in the project. If I have been on both sides of the ball on both types of project structures, they can work really well for nonprofits either way when done well. Um, but you get to that point, something always falls off the edge. There's always something that you kind of wished you had more. Whenever there's possible, have a contingency on the budget. A lot of places will come back without real contingencies in their, pl their plans, and the nonprofit doesn't necessarily have that built into their structure. One of the things I was able to do when I was at the service committee with our migration to Drupal is I got a $20,000 grant, so I knew I had $20,000. We actually had additional money. I didn't know how much it was because it was going to be the extra in our, you know, we were going to cut some corners on the, in the department budget, we were going to scrape together some internal money, and so we treated that as our contingency. That we bid the project out as a $20,000 project, but I, I had always told folks, I have extra money. I don't know what it is. I can't promise you huge. I can promise you I can write you a check tomorrow for $20,000 because 
that's the grant I have, so it's guaranteed. And this was in 2008, so everybody was really worried about whether nonprofits could pay their bills because nobody could pay their bills in, 2000, in late 2008 and 2009. Uh, so there, there was that reassurance for them that I can guarantee X, uh, but I had this extra. Uh, and that was an Agile-like process, and we got through close to the end, partway through, and there was a, an emerging opportunity to reorganize part of the project, and we wanted to take advantage of it. And they, they gave me that warning. They were you know, a good partner, and they looked at me and said, look, something's going to, you know, we're going to have to take something else off. This is going to suck up hours here. We're not going to have time for some stuff at the other end. How you doing on that contingency? Um, and when we got to the end, and you know, I could approve it confidently at that point, in part because I knew we were starting to have some extra money, that we were going to be able to extend the project just a little further, add a few more things on, and be able to roll it forward you know, out into that contingency. You don't have to know exactly what your contingency is when you start. You don't uh, have to uh, plan exactly you know, all the details, but having that ability to extend the project just a little bit and an acknowledgement on both sides that there needs to be some flexibility to the project budget. Um, and so either undersizing below what the grant provided, um, finding additional money around, you will end up with a better website that makes you happier, uh, and you will have a happier client, you'll be a happier nonprofit, when you can go that last little bit, when you can get that next piece in that didn't quite fit, that pushed you out of scope, pushed it off the edge of the process, uh, and allows you to have uh, a little bit more. People often kind of look at, because this is coming out of communications, nonprofits often look at uh, building their website as part of the communications things and they, they compare it to their print budgets. And they don't put a lot of contingency in a print budget for a brochure because people are really good at knowing how much a brochure costs. Uh, building a website is a lot more like building a building. Nobody builds a building without contingencies because something goes wrong every time. Uh, and we've been building buildings for a long time in our, in our culture. Uh, and so making sure you bring into that communications mindset, that print production mindset, a little bit of that flexibility to say, you're going to need a contingency. I don't know why you need it. If I knew why, I'd avoid it. You need a contingency because there's going to be something that goes wrong that you need to adapt to as you get to the end. With that, are there questions for either of us? Um, do you just use straight up Drupal 7 and give or, <coughs> give or try Open Church or? Uh, I haven't worked with Open Church. I know some folks who've done it. Um, and that one in particular has gone through stretches of being a. So, oh, so she asked me. Sorry, just repeat the question. Uh, she's asking if, if we work with uh, the Open Church distribution of Drupal. Um, and, and we haven't, um, in part because that one was doing quite well for a long time, and then the project maintainers got busy. Uh, is, is as one to happen, uh, and then wandered away and have now come back, and it's my sense is doing much better again. Um, but that gap in between, it, it made us nervous. You know, we provide long-term support. And so if, we don't, if we're using a distribution like that, we don't have a partner who's got dedicated resources to keep it up, it makes us really nervous. Um, and I did some looking, and the truth is that Quakers are Kind of weird. That's what I'm. That's who I'm building for. <laughs> oh, seriously! Yeah. Wow. Which meeting? Uh, uh, Tampa. Oh, cool. And, and also uh, uh, Chronica, an outreach they have. In oh yeah, <laughs> that's great. Um, you should talk to him lots of days. Yeah, we could. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, what we found is that Open Church was structurally wasn't quite what we were looking for, um, at least for the FGC site. What, what do you normally, if you've done about 60 of these, um, and, oh, and and so there's some things, I guess, that are in common if you're dealing with the Quaker organizations, but what do you budget? I and mean, what do you tell a nonprofit to budget for a website? Because I've heard everything from like 5000 to 50000 on up, but using Drupal, it's free. I mean, right. what do you tell them? To right, our strategy is to use Drupal because it's free. And, and, and we'll be able to get our budget to go far. Uh -huh. What do you tell them to budget? I, I'm just curious. So, 
I'm not talking about a fairly mid to large size I, I, IPO, not maybe a small. So when I when I've had that conversation with folks, I try to immediately get it into a more nuanced conversation. You can do a pretty much a brochure site, you know, basically a custom theme with a little bit of customization, really pretty cheap. Um, you know, that basically you're looking at a designer's time and maybe a site builder's time. It's you know the five thousand dollar range. If your if your wish list is small, you can do quite well at that price line. Um, but price matters, or you know, what, what your wish list matters a lot, and so you have to understand what their goal is. You know, what is it that you want to do with the website? Why do you have one other than we're supposed to have one because we're an organization, which is true. But then, what are you doing with it? If you're just posting stories and it's pretty simple. You can stay to the smaller budgets, but once they start talking about constituent engagement and integration with other tools and other things that are very common with nonprofits and very good things for them to be doing, you have to, to start going further up the budget. Um, and so often I like to encourage folks to do some kind of uh, early project with somebody, you know, work with a consultant to talk about, talk through your project so that you can scope it um, and have some sense from the outside about what on earth should this thing cost, put me in a ballpark. Because if somebody comes and says, we need a website, what's it cost? I can't ballpark that because I, you know, I have been involved personally with projects that range from my staff time to uh, large five digit numbers. I know folks who've gone in nonprofits up into mid, you know, mid size six digit numbers. <clears throat> they got a lot more. <laughs> Than my, I put out on my staff talk. And I hack at it for a weekend. I don't do nearly as much as when you take a year and a half and, and spend $225,000. Yeah, it sounds like you're working with established organizations that have quite a bit of historic content. And I would think it would be in the twenty-five dollars to thirty thousand range. I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's often been a range that I'm in with those kinds of projects. But again, it, it you know, are we doing a Salesforce integration on the back end? Are we doing a, a you know, do they have a race edge site that they need to connect? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was actually just going to ask if there, besides Open Church, are there more popular distributions in the nonprofit world that tend to be successful? Um, so, Commons was uh, has been used a lot. Uh, you'll often find webs, uh, uh, nonprofits running a, a version of Commons. Um, Open outreach. I haven't encountered that much, but that may just. I have not met everybody, so I certainly. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't, you're, you're falling behind on your to do list. <laughs> we used Open Atrium for a while. Um, I, I guess I we've sort of backed away from that when it, it looks like support for it may, be, may have been evaporating. So I mean, that's generally one of the takes, and I, and I touched on it earlier. Is one of the issues with the distributions is how much energy is there behind it for keeping it up? Does somebody have a, is somebody who's working on it being paid to work on it yeah. to make sure it survives? Two questions. Okay. One, you mentioned making grant applications and getting money from somebody. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on that? And two, um, <laughs> <laughs> you would like a list of who has money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you betcha. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and and two, you mentioned that there's like a, a core set of features that you know nonprofits should be looking at, you know, seriously for an engaging website. What type of core features are you? What are you talking about? Sure. What do they? What do we need to put on the site? A non-church, non-religious site. Let me just clarify. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Um, so to, to the grant question. Uh, you know, no, I don't have a list of everybody who has money who might cough it up. Uh, usually, there are there are enough foundations at this point who recognize the importance of good communications as part of a mission of a nonprofit that finding some of the foundations that look at whatever it is the issue you're in. Right? There's usually a foundation that works on medical issues or lots on that one uh, you know even if you're looking at peace or social justice or uh, any number of kind of subtopics there's usually a few foundations out there and most of them are at this point can be approached for 
support for a project, um, particularly if you are doing something engaging, right? Where you're not just saying, eh, we need to update our brochure site. Um, but when you're getting into a larger, more encompassing project, um, I'm gonna get nudged here about time because it's uh, 10 of. <laughs> okay, the, so you, you'd asked about what the core functions that folks uh, look for. Uh, if, you, if the organization does any kind of advocacy, um, petitioning any form of government or company even, uh, obviously the, the, the online advocacy engagement tools are expected of most folks. Um, the ability to interact with the staff in some way, to be able to ask a question and get an answer in a timely manner. Um, so, and again, that gets to a question of strategy. Do you do that just doing it in a Facebook group? Do you manage a, have a blog? Would you accept comments and make sure your staff are responding to? That's a strategy question, but that ability to engage back and forth with an actual staff person who you know a name of, and you can call the organization and they can forward you to their desk or wherever it is they work, so that the, it humanizes the organization. Uh, I mean, there was one more question in the back that I'm going to take, and then we are running over time. I, I'm sure Chris and I are happy to, I know I'm happy, I'm sure yeah. Chris is happy to talk as long as folks want to. But. So the, the question is how do we handle support and maintenance on an ongoing basis? Um, there's a couple aspects to that. One is, I kind of implied it when we were in, during the presentation of, you set that up as part of the conversation when you're introducing your solution. So making it clear to them that when we give you a Drupal site, it will require maintenance. Um, I'm usually pretty open with folks who ask me that it actually doesn't have to be us, right? The folks who built your site don't have to be the folks who maintained it. Drupal has a lot of other folks out there. And that usually makes people more comfortable because they have that sense they can shop around. They usually won't because you'll have made them happy by building a website. Um, but there is that sense. And, and when I was at a nonprofit, I did change up my support um, from time to time because your, you know, your relationship runs its course. They're, the, strat you know, the consultant is moving off to another direction. You're not anymore their focus. You know, it's not necessarily a, like, I'm firing you because you're bad. Uh, but you know, sometimes it gets ugly. But usually it's just you're bond going in two different directions. Um, I can tell you, even in the business community, you know, business websites, that happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Check. Yeah, and, and the other piece of it then is that, that ongoing relationship of now and then we've, I, I've seen, I've both been again, the client who walks away or the, we've had clients, a message agency who walk away and that recognition about six months later of, oh, this is what I was paying for. Um, <laughs> you know, they, all of a sudden, like, oh, I knew I had a support contract with somebody for a reason. Now I remember because I'm up a creek. Um, Yeah, yeah, having some kind of retainer relationship that, that allows them to, because they don't want to ever pay by the dip, right? Nonprofit is never going to want to be comfortable paying a variable amount. They want to have something they can put in their budget to show the executive director um, that it's consistent. And this is what it costs us to have a website. It's a lot easier for them to sell it in the budget process than it could cost us nothing this month and uh, you know, $2,000 next month terrifies people for good reasons. <laughs> yeah. uh, another thing is, is being intentional about what's included in that so, you know, is it 
well, we want to do minor tweaks adding functionality, um, and we've done that, and now there's no hours left for that security patch that nobody was expecting that leaves our site vulnerable. Um, so like I said, yeah, we, we've uh, run a bit over time here. I'm happy to, to chat yeah. with whoever wants to chat for as long. I just don't want to be rude to whoever's coming in next. Thanks.